about Darcy right now. I'm freaking out. Okay. <laughs> Let's calm down. <clears throat> Sorry for that. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, a couple days ago, I made a video where I talked about Darcy, about how much I love freaking Darcy. This is basically a follow-up video because we just had the Core and the King release earlier today, and I'm freaking out, everybody. It's so good. It's everything I wanted and more. Oh my gosh. So, quick recap of the last video. If you didn't watch it, I'll go through this as quick as possible. Basically, all I did was talk about how much I love Darcy, how Marcy was my favorite character. She still is, obviously. But the fact that Darcy takes over Marcy is uh, something that I just find so extremely interesting. And just the limitless potential that Darcy has, which has been a bit more, I don't know, not say narrowed, but like, I absolutely love the direction they're taking Darcy. In this episode, it's actually literally everything I wanted and more. I had so many questions that I was asking about Darcy. How? She basically only had three voice lines, which actually now there's only two, because one of them was Andrews' father, which is technically part of the core anyways, so maybe it's like two and a half. It's a little weird. But yeah, I talked about how much I like Marcy and Darcy, and now I'm gonna talk about how much I love Darcy's video, and then also do like a bit of an episodic review, because I think I might do that every single week, because this show is coming to an end, and I wanna talk about it as much as I can. There we go. <laughs> Forgive me if this is a very fast paced and disorganized uh, little talk. I'm very new to making these videos, if you can't already tell. So, whew, we finally got Darcy voice lines besides just why hello there and you suck Andreas basically. <laughs> Darcy is everything that I wanted and more. So, what I was talking about in the last video was I didn't know what the cores slash Darcy, uh, just Darcy, but I didn't know what Darcy's personality was going to be like. I didn't know if they were going to be just a boring version of the core where it's just a bunch of dead old guys on a computer being like, oh, blah, 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 we are cool, whatever. Or if it was gonna be more like Marcy. It's actually straight up a combination. I was talking about, I wonder if they were merged. They basically are. The core can access Marcy's memories without the other way around. I was theorizing that. I was like, what if maybe they can both access each other's memories? Nope, it's one way. The core confirms that they've hidden Marcy in a room, like a mental room where they can access her memories, but she's basically trapped in there. So that's what's happening to Marcy right now. But I absolutely love that they've inherited some of her quirks, as the core puts it. It's amazing. And I like the fact that they even like the name Darcy. Why don't you call us Darcy? Darcy? They decided to call themselves Darcy because of Marcy and her whole, you know, the fact that villainous versions of heroic people are just have dark in front of them. You know, freaking Dark Link, Dark Mario, I guess Shadow Mario, whatever. They have lots of dark in front of them. Dark Pit, like, come on, I, mostly Nintendo, but whatever. You get what I'm saying, right? It, it, it's just a thing. Just add dark in front of it. It's like, oh, it's the evil version now. <laughs> and that's what I love. It is for Dark Marcy. It's so, oh, it's so good. It's so good. The fact. Oh, Darcy's everything I wanted, guys. I can't explain to you how it's just, it's literally just like villainous Marcy. It has all of Marcy's quirks, and I love that. Like, even when it's just like, oh, let's, we're talking about villainous things, and it's like, ooh, cupcakes, hooray, my favorite. And the core's like, yay, we have a body. This is so cool. And they express that desire, or that, I guess, feeling of having a body through Marcy, the, the Marciness, and it's so good. As a villainous character, it's so good because I think Darcy is the perfect embodiment of Amphibia as a show. Because Amphibia as a show, as we have come to know, is a very good balance of lots and lots of plots and like hidden things in the background, as well as a lot of comedy. There are jokes throughout every episode, like crazy, even during like the most intense scenes. Like in True Colors, there were just jokes. It's like, how are you throwing jokes and not disrupting the mood of the show? It's such an impressive feat that the writers do, and I absolutely love it. This is all my opinion, by the way. I don't know if this is, like, confirmed by any, you know, uh, scholars of uh, writing. <laughs> no, I'm just some random dude who gushes about TV shows. That's this, that's it. And this is what I, this is my personal opinion. I absolutely love it. And I think Darcy, once again, is the perfect embodiment where she can be, you know, from a coin flip, she can be like, let's take over Earth. Haha, -ha, fun time, or yay, cupcakes, <laughs> right? It's so good. Like, she stuffs her, she stuffs her face full of cupcakes and is like, off we go, splat. <laughs> it's so funny. Oh, it makes me want to see Darcy fall down a flight of stairs. But, you know, I wonder if they still have free health care. Maybe? They probably still. No, they're probably sending all the money toward the war effort. They probably don't have free health care anymore. I also want to talk about just like 
the mannerisms of the core. Uh, like, one part when they're like, oh, it's a reference to Marchie's favorite video game. Like, the way they put their hands together, it's just like, they pretty much take Marchie's mannerisms, but also kind of give a spin on it, give the core spin on it. Like, I love the eye movements of the core. We haven't really got to see the core, you know, see with their eyes, really. <laughs> like, it, just the animation of the eyes is so clean. It's so fluid. Like, I love it. Obviously, like, it's just the main three eyes. And then we have, like, the other eyes in the background. But it's so good. It just looks so good. The fluidness of the eyes, it's just, like, it's looking how it should actually look. I thought this was going to be, like, maybe just, like, some boring random hell. But no, it looks so good. Going even further, I absolutely love when the core starts taunting Andreas. I've, obviously, we've seen that before when she called him pathetic, but here, I think it's so good. This is like a really, really good scene where Marcy would never do this, right? This is something that it's like the core. It's more of the core, but it uses Marcy's like, I don't know, Marciness to kind of convey this to Andreas. When Andreas is walking by the painting that he obviously scratched up of his past friends, you know, the core is like, oh, maybe you should, maybe I'm not the only one who needs to get rid of memories. Because obviously they're talking about how they have to get rid of, I think, Marcy's uh, redundant memory or something like that, which is why they need a system reboot. So we don't even know what's happening with the whole system reboot. It wasn't entirely clear. Maybe I'll have to like rewatch it and see. But they're going through a system reboot in this episode, the core is, to get rid of like excess memory slash storage, I'm guessing, to make room for calibration because they're falling over. <laughs> So they're still getting used to the body, obviously, even though it's been like a couple months or something. I don't know. I like how they're still attached to the cord, by the way. That's still super cool. And I love the way when they're taunting Andreas that you can hear one of the voices in the core start to dominate. Maybe we're not the only ones who need to let go of old memories. Why, son? I think I'm almost proud of you. And it's Andreas' father because Andreas' father became part of the core. I also wonder how you become part of the core. Do you just like upload your mind? Do you, it's not a copy paste, right? You can't just copy paste yourself into the core. Do you just like upload your mind into the core and then boom, the body is just like a vegetable now? Like, is that what happens? Do they just have to like bury the king? He's like, oh, he died. No, he uploaded his mind to the core. He's in there. Cause the freaking Darcy calls Andreas her son, which is like obviously just one of the minds in the core doing that. But I love how one of the voices dominates where you hear like the marshes and then like the marcy voice like slowly goes out and you hear andrew's father talking it's so freaking good dude oh i love it oh and that smile at the end too oh my gosh it it was that was the taunt before the beginning of the episode but oh my gosh the ending when darcy's like "Ooh, i'm proud of you son that gave me chills the eyes the taunt, the voice domination again. Oh my gosh, it's so good. It's so good. And that's what I mean. Just like 10 seconds before, the car was like, yay, Earth, let's take it over. It's like, good job, bud. I'm proud of you. It's just like, it's so silly. The car is like so silly. It's so Marcy in this. But then it's just like, I'm proud of you, son. And it's so, ah, oh, it's perfect. Absolutely perfect. It's so, it's like, I don't know how to describe it. This villain is like so good. I play a lot of Fire Emblem. I'm so used to like dumb villains. Like for example, Fire Emblem Fates. They talk a lot about birthright and conquest in this uh, episode. So I was t thinking a lot about Fire Emblem Fates. And one of the villains in that game, Garen, is just some dumb, boring villain who just talks about how evil he is. He's just like, I'm evil. And he keeps reiterating lines about how he's evil. And it's so dumb. But Darcy is just like, Ah, oh, it's so good. It's so it's like you don't even know. It's like they're just a person. They they but they have villainous gold and it's just <sighs> it's everything I wanted. It's literally everything I wanted. I had so many questions in this video. I still have a lot of questions now. Still do. Like what's really happening to Marcy inside? We obviously know she's stuck in a room, but maybe some of her redundant memories were not so much erased, but I don't know, set to the side. It's not really clear. I want to know more. Ah, oh, and it's just I love the like obviously the mouth is like the only thing that still represents Marcy's part of her face and she's still got those little cheek things or she's got like the little you know little marcy cheeks i, I love it it's so good dude it's so freaking good uh okay enough about darcy though first I, I i love it i love it i also at the beginning i like how she's like making fun of the technology as well it's just ah oh, it's so good it's so freaking good this is even kind of foreshadowed i love how the whole marcy being a part of darcy or like even just the mannerisms uh, that Darcy has is Marcy, or are Marcy, 
because in Froggy Little Christmas when she was holding the D20, I theorized in my last video where I was like, I feel like Marcy's still gonna be part of the core. It's not just gonna be entirely the core because she was holding the D20. The core doesn't care about a D20. They only care about it because Marcy's partially interested in it. And that's what they love. And that's the thing is like the, the cupcakes and the whole, oh, Dark Marcy because of it was one of her video games. They searched her memories and they, you know, adapted and sort of took them on as part of themselves. The core is only like, what is it? It was like, I think it was like confirmed to have like a certain amount of people. I forget. I've seen like various numbers. I've seen eight, I've seen 10, I've seen 13. I've seen a lot of 10. I'm not really entirely sure how many people are inside the core. Uh, something I can obviously just check later, but I don't know. I just love how they've really just taken Marcy and added so much to her. It's like, it's so complex. It's such a complex villain and I just love it. The first minute I was just like, I had a massive grin on my face. It was hurting. And then obviously we get into the rest of the episode. Honestly, a really good episode. Besides just me talking about freaking my Darcy brain rot, I have to stop. Let's talk about the episode itself. So first off, uh, one thing that I think a lot of people are going to immediately notice is Leaf, the pink frog, is surely an ancestor uh, of the planters. She has to be. I don't remember if she was in the planter family tunnels, but this just makes the planter family tunnels have even make even more sense, right? Th these two episodes had so much callbacks to season one, so I wanted to talk about that a little bit. So first off, we're talking about Leaf. Obviously, she ran away with the Calamity Box. This, this episode answers so many questions. So first off, one main question I had was, how did the Calamity Box get to Earth? I was like, no one knows. No one knows how the Calamity Box got to Earth. It's probably because of Leaf. She did something with that. She ran away with the Calamity Box. She took it away from the castle, got away on a Moss Man, and that's also where the, uh, the freaking Moss Man in the wild comes from. Because there's Moss Men in the castle, right? They took them from other worlds, it sounds like, uh, to my knowledge. But, unless they were from Amphibia and they just captured them. But I imagine that one lone Moss Man that Anne and frickin' Wally tracked down in that one episode, it's the same Moss Man from that frickin' Leaf ran away on. So that's another callback to season one, which I think is so good, because she runs away on a Moss Man. She takes the Calamity Box, and somehow it gets, we don't know how it gets to Earth, but it gets to Earth somehow, and she runs away. But she's a pink frog, and she does Hot Pops dance, like the planter family dance of the the hunting or whatever that Sprig showed Anne how to do. The when they were like uh, how in the hunting episode, I think it was that wasn't Hot Pops dance. I'm pretty sure Hot Pops dance is different. I think this is the hunting dance. She was doing the hunting dance, which I think was so cool. And you can really tell that because she literally just looks like Sprig with like hair and a hood. That she literally just looks like Sprig with hair and a hood. That that's it. She literally said looks like Sprig. She even has a voice kind of similar to Sprig. But it's, she's clearly an ancestor of the planters, which I think is so freaking cool because it ties Andreas and the planters together. It makes the planters more important to the plot, which I love because the planters have been, I don't, I don't wanna say lacking in the plot, but they're definitely like not as important as like the Calamity Trio and Andreas. And I absolutely love that. Like Leaf is so important to this story and I absolutely love it. It's just like, it's all coming together, this entire, thing is coming together in this one episode. I think it's absolutely insane. So, Leaf probably settled in Wartwood and created the Planter family tunnels as a way to potentially counter Andres in the future. Or like, she made them for a reason, right? She surely was the inventor of the Planter family tunnels and just used farming because she was a gardener, right? So she knew how to farm. So she passed on that knowledge and obviously went to a farming town and such. And it's just, it's so good. It's so good because it's like it all ties together. It's such good writing. Oh, it's so freaking good. I absolutely love it. There's just so much depth and detail. And it's like they didn't know about the Planter Family Tunnels. And I remember when I first watched that, I was like, when are the Planter Family Tunnels going to reappear? Obviously, we saw that in um, the episode after Escape to Amphibia. I forget which one it was. I think it was Commander Anne. Yeah, in Commander Anne, we finally figured out that's obviously the frogs uh, of Wartwood and everybody else, they hid underneath. Uh, the Planter Family Tunnels as like the rebellious base and I love that. It's so good. So it's as if Leaf is still being carried on. Her like legacy is still being carried on in the Planter Family Tunnels to counter Andreas. And I think that's so cool. That's so freaking cool because Andreas is still up in the castle. Even in this episode you can see he was like beaming stuff like crazy. No, that was in the last episode. Never mind. That was in the uh, Apothecary Gary Returns episode, which is another callback to season one, which I think is so funny. It's like they didn't leave any loose ends. It's like stuff that happened in season one returns in season three. It's so cool. It's so freaking cool. Oh my gosh. It's like we saw 
when Jerry, or sorry, Jeremy, the freaking beetle, who was a reoccurring side character, licked up the freaking apothecary Gary Goo, and is now back, and they've even teamed up. That's in the last episode, but we'll talk about that a little later. It's so good. It's so good how they're making callbacks to season one, and it just, it just all comes together. It's just, oh my gosh, it's so freaking good. It is so good. I'm sad that more people aren't interested in this show. I personally think that this has, like, incredible writing. Like, what is it? You know, everyone talked about The Last Airbender. I think this show is on par, or... I don't, I don't know if I can say better. That show is really good. But I think it's, like, on par. It's so good. It, um, obviously, again, just my opinion. But I think it's so good. And Avatar The Last Airbender has such a massive appeal. And maybe it's just because, like, I don't know, people are kind of... Not interested in the whole frog dynamic of Amphibia, but I, I don't know. I, I'm into it. I think it's cool. I wasn't big on it at first, but I eventually grew to love it, and I absolutely am just obsessed with everything in this world. It's so good. Another thing uh, that is something to point out, remember when... Oh, I forget the name of the episode, but it was the episode where Sasha and Grime had to go to, like, the Toads and get, like, the Toad army for True Colors. We saw that, like, corpse Toad that was, like, really old and, like, wasn't talking, but then it eventually did talk. This might be Beryl in this episode. We saw, obviously, the trio of friends. Beryl is, like, the third member of that. And it looks like he might be that rotting corpse in the, uh, I forget. I don't think they had a name for him, did they? And what another thing that I really like is, I don't know if it's the exact same hammer, but if you look at the hammer he's wielding, does it not look like the hammer that Grime now has? I forget what they called it. Something Thunder? I forget. But the trial that they went through in that episode where Sasha and Grime had to get the hammer off that beast, it's surely the same hammer, right? This is so good because I love how it has unity between a frog, a toad, and a newt, which is like the three main species, in the start of the episode. Obviously, they're all getting along, and we see how they become separated because Andreas is like so under pressure to make the right call because of his father and the core. His father had, with the crown, had the core eyeball inside of it. And like whenever Andreas' father didn't know what to do, he relied on the core. You could just see that and that was so cool. And since Andreas didn't have the core, he was obviously, you know, still Andreas-y. He still started making some calls. I don't know if it was with the core's advice, but he started talking about how like leafed people are not to be trusted. And that's how we see how the frogs ended up being like to the bottom of the society. It was a thousand years of this. This is a thousand years ago. We have to remember, this is a thousand years ago. It's a, been a long freaking time. Oh my gosh, something that I just noticed. Uh, I don't know if this is actually the case. It's probably just an Easter egg. But if you look in the background of this shot, you can actually see that thing from the Owl House. You see that? That's from the Owl House, is it not? And that was like King's little guardian. Uh, I don't know, I forget what they call it, but is it not that thing? It looks very similar. It very well could just be a coincidence, but it looks very similar. Obviously, it's just, it's not the most complex design of all time, but it looks very similar. I don't know if that's just an Easter egg, but I think that looks really cool. And it's something that you notice. Obviously, in the shot, I was going to the shot to talk about how Andreas is still using, like, the little beam sword, the lightsaber, which pretty much has similar lightsaber sounds. There's been a lot of Star Wars references lately <laughs> in this show with, like, Escape to Amphibia and, but... This one's just, oh, it's so good. It's so good. You can see Andrew's like, you know, using the sword as he does in the future. It looks like a smaller version, obviously, but he's smaller in this, so it just makes sense. I just like how they're using like the same weapons from long ago. Is Andreas going to be redeemed? There's like a lot of people wondering if Andreas might be redeemed in this episode. And obviously the best way to redeem a villain, or at least how I've always seen, is give them an emotional backstory. Oh no, the villain has an emotional backstory, so now, now that we've seen Andres' backstory, maybe he can still be redeemed. I love how he still retains the qualities of his young Andreas self to a degree. Like, you know how when we first met Andres, he was all just like fun and games. This original Andreas was basically just fun and games. You know, he was messing with freaking Barrel. They were doing, they were like having fun times. It was cool. It was cool. He like enjoyed his friends. And now it's just like through the pressure of his father, he had to make those tough calls. And it still feels like we're seeing that today. Obviously, he's still struggling with it, as we can tell in this episode. He's, you know, every time he passes by the painting, he's not looking too good. And it, again, it just also ties back to Andrews' statement when he drops Sprig in True Colors. When he's like, that's the thing about friends. The, the more you care about them, the more it hurts to see them go. And I feel like that's entirely true because he dropped Sprig, an ancestor of Leaf, 
basically another way of him, you know, pushing Leaf out of his life, or at least literally trying to kill her, basically, <laughs> but pushing Leaf out of his life. And it was, you know, he was basically saying that a lot to himself. He was speaking from experience to Anne, saying that it's sad when you see them go. And I loved that. Like, obviously, you could tell he was, you know, experienced in losing friends just from that line alone. But now it just feels even more impactful now that uh, we've seen this episode. This episode is so good, everybody. This is like literally one of the best episodes of Amphibia. Hands freaking down, if not just because of freaking Darcy. Even though she's only had like two minutes of screen time, it's enough. It's enough to satisfy me for like weeks. I'm, I swear, dude. I can't believe this show is coming to an end in a month, dude. I can't. More, less than a month. Less than a month. This show is ending. I can't believe it. I literally can't. It's absolutely insane. Oh my gosh. So I think one of the last things I want to talk about in this video, because I can't go on forever or else this video will end up being like a long, long, long time. It's probably already much longer than I wanted it to be. I really just wanted it to be like, you know, a follow up to the Darcy video, but I think I changed my mind and I just want to make more Amphibia videos because I freaking love the series. I might even make a video about the freaking Owl House, the, the episode that came out because I freaking love the Owl House too. I very well could do that. I want to talk about more cartoons in this channel. This is my second video. So, sorry, I know that. The last thing I want to talk about is Leaf's vision because this looked pretty intense. So I'm gonna like rewatch the clip and talk about it right now. So Leaf touches the Calamity Stones. She immediately sees the future. She's given a vision of the future where she sees what is happening right now in Amphibia, where we see, you know, everything. Uh, they're mining their own planet for resources because Andreas, I guess, can't take over Earth just yet. Earth was still in their, you know, medieval times. So they don't, they wouldn't have posed nearly a big a threat a thousand years ago but now we have like nukes and stuff you know we have we have weapons now so maybe he's taking care uh not to be too careless with earth obviously darcy did look at the phone and say that their technology was stupid but they probably know that earth is like a threat you know they do research on planets i just don't know why they're not you know doing research into other planets it's a little weird because if they're trying to get resources why ruin your own planet to do so it's a little weird you think you'd want to mine other planets first but I don't know. Anyway, she sees the future. She sees Amphibia, you know, being mind of its resources. The Calamity Box being opened. She sees the mural of Andreas and the Calamity Box and whatnot. The tower rising, the mural. And at the end, we see something that we've never seen before, and that is the meteor. The meteor coming down on what looks like... It took me a second. Yeah, it's, it's in the lily pad formation, so that's Amphibia. A meteor comes down toward Amphibia which is like a little strange. I don't know why a meteor is coming down toward Amphibia, but as at the end of the vision, you can see it's like straight up coming all the way down, which is not something that we've seen in the plot at all, which makes me think a lot about what the ending of Amphibia is going to be. Are they going to have to maybe work together to stop this meteor? I feel like maybe after the final battle, you know, maybe you know, Andreas and the core will finally realize the error of their ways. Probably not, but we'll see. Like this is again, just a theory. Like, what if they realize the error of their ways, and they team up, like, the whole, you know, we still have Darcy, maybe it's Marcy now, we don't know. But the core, Andreas, and the Calamity Trio, the Planters, and whoever else wants to come, everybody joins up against, you know, saving the planet. Because the YouTube comment that Matt Broly commented on about how it's not just about a final battle, it's about how the Calamity Trio are fighting for Amphibia's soul, and, like, fighting against the greed and corruption. So if they're fighting specifically against that and not just, you know, bad guy Andreas, dead guys at the computer, maybe we're going to see them stop Amphibia, or the leaders of Amphibia, from becoming the worst version of themselves, as Mother Own put it. And the greatest test to do that is by protecting their planet, protecting Amphibia from an outside threat. Obviously, an outside threat is a great way to make things come together. You know, enemy of my enemy is my friend or whatever. And even though Meteor is just not really an enemy, it's just a thing. It makes me really wonder, like, they'll have to, maybe after the fight, they'll finally realize the error of their ways. And they could be potentially redeemed, and we could take out the Meteor. I don't know if the core would be all for that, because maybe Andreas can be redeemed, because he is just one person. But the core has, like... I don't know, eight plus people, potentially, reinforcing the idea that they need to be freaking conquerors. That conquest is their birthright. But we must have a revelation instead. Okay, enough about Fire and Fates. <laughs> I didn't talk too much about the last episode. There wasn't really that much to talk about. It was fun. You know, it, it was just like a cult. And then Apothecary Gary returns, and we get some season one references. I don't think I'm missing too much else there. It was just a good episode. 
I don't know. I, I'm all for this episode. I'm t I can tell you I'm already going to rewatch it like 500 times. I've probably put up a thousand things in editing already that I haven't noticed at first. Oh, I'm so excited. Oh, I'm so excited for this, for the rest of the show, dude. And my Darcy brain rot has gotten worse, guys. It's only getting worse from here. My Darcy brain rot, now every single waking thought of mine is going to be filled with Darcy. It, it, it was bad before, it's getting worse. It's gonna get worse. Just like the core, you know, making room for new memories. That's what I'm doing. Every single thing in my mind is being replaced with Darcy. All my years of academics, is just being shoved out. I'm becoming dumber and have just become have Darcy brain rot. Every bit of knowledge of my mind is just being replaced and taken over by Darcy. It's as if I am wearing the helmet of Darcy. It is as I am the core possessed. I'm not, but it feels like it because I constantly have Darcy brain rot. It's really bad. It's really bad. Anyway, thank you so much for watching everybody. Please let me know your thoughts on this episode or episodes or just amphibian in general and any theories you got for the future. I'm psyched. I'm freaking psyched. All right, that's it. I can't talk anymore. Bye. <laughs>